be videotaped. And then Ronnie Mann, who's an awesome guy. I don't know if y'all have ever met Mr. Mann. He's the one that's probably videotaped all my health assessments. He does all the videotaping for faculty all the time. So I've worked with him many years. Um, but we're delighted that you came today, too. Um, but he, it takes him a while to get it processed and synced with the PowerPoints. Um, but it will be up uh, for you as soon as possible, too. Okay? So, um, welcome. Melanie. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes. Oh, wow. Thank yes. you. Yes. You're going to be the first volunteer up today, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you all for having me. My name is Melanie Redding. I'm the Child Life Program Manager at Nice Wonger Children's Hospital. I want to give a shout out in the very back to Brittany. You can wave. I already told her I was going to make her come up and demonstrate something later. But I have the opportunity every day to work with wonderful people like Brittany and nurses and physicians and physical therapists and dietitians. The list goes on and on um, of the privilege that I have to work with um, the children and their families during what we know and you all understand will be the most sometimes trying experiences that they may have in their family um, in the most difficult of times. So there's lots of different areas that you're going to be involved in um, in working with children. So my background basically is whenever I was a college student, much like you all, it seems too long ago now, <laughs> but um, I was a junior in college and my family was faced with a very difficult crisis. My dad was diagnosed with cancer and we found ourselves at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. And the first person that came to meet with me and my two younger sisters was a child life specialist. And she was able to quickly explain to us in terms that not only I understood as a college student, but my middle school sister understood, my high school sister understood what the situation was with my dad. And she did that with all sorts of appropriate developmental terms, um, play equipment, telling us exactly what we could expect. We worked with her throughout the next two weeks while we were there with my dad. And then basically my dad ended up passing away about nine months later. And we got a call from her at our home from Florida just following up with us as well. So I knew right then, you know, you've experienced a horrible trauma in your life. And I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to do that for the rest of my life. So I went right after college. I worked in Greenville, South Carolina at their children's hospital there, um, worked in their cancer center. And that was for about five years. And then I've also had experience at East Tennessee Children's Hospital in their emergency department. And then it's nice, I was telling Miss Merriman, it's nice to be back on a college campus. I was actually director of admissions at Carson Newman for about 10 years, kind of a hiatus from child life, and then recently came back to Nice Wonger about a year ago. So it's my privilege to be here today, and that's kind of the background. But we're going to talk about just integrating child life services um, into the hospital experience. And if you want to go ahead and flip us over, um, maybe if you want to go to a couple more, one more. There we go. All right, thank you. So how many of you have even heard of a child life specialist before? Has anybody heard of it? Have any of you had experience working with a child life spe specialist yet? <laughs> I love it, Brittany, thank you. <laughs> um, well, basically, a child life specialist, um, you have to have a minimum of a bachelor's degree. Um, but you can see here by uh, 2022, um, all child life specialists will be required to have a master's degree. And those are degrees in child development, typically. There are several child life programs um, at various institutions that you can go through. Um, in addition to your degree, you also have to have a 480 hour internship. Many times you have hours leading up to that internship practicums. Um, I had 200 hours of practicum experience shadowing child life specialists before I went into my internship. Um, following that, just similar to you all, how stressed are you that you're going to have to take your nursing exams? I'm seeing a smile down here. It's stressful, isn't it? <laughs> Same thing is true in child life. We have a certification exam, and I was stressing out about a year ago when I had to sit back down and take it again. So um, some people at work were really praying that I was passing it that day. Um, so following the certification exam, um, we have to have professional hours to maintain certification over a five-year period, or you can retake the test every five years. And then obviously we have um, the code of ethics and standards that are established by the Child Life Council that we follow. So that's a little background on um, the education that we have and um, our certification. All right, so what is child life? Child life, really where there's so many people in the healthcare environment that you are so focused on the physical well-being of the child, right? 
We've got to make sure that they're getting the fluids that they need. We've got to check their urine. We've got to check their blood. We've got to do all these things. As a child life specialist, we're interested in their psychosocial um, concerns and those that accompany the healthcare experience by promoting optimal child development. And obviously we know that their development can be affected whenever they are in the hospital. What's the one thing? All of a sudden, I think all the time, a baby, for example, let's say you have a toddler and they've gotten out of diapers and then they're in the hospital and all of a sudden they're like wetting again. They're wetting the bed and mom's freaking out and she's like, he's been potty trained, what's going on? Same thing, the development of the child is being affected by the hospital or the healthcare experience. Um, so we want to, our goal is to minimize adverse effects in development. And then also we want to use play and psychological preparation as primary tools um, that child life interventions facilitate coping and adjustment under circumstances that might otherwise be completely overwhelming for a child. So basically our goal is to make sure that through play and through assessment that the child and the family are coping well with the hospital experience to minimize any developmental regression. Okay, so that's basically what child life is in a big nutshell. We're going to explore the basics of child life and the first thing that we always have to explore is play. That's what so many people, child life started back years and years ago with a lady named Emma Plank. Emma Plank was called a play lady in the hospital and even still today you'll have people walk by and they'll say, hey, where's that play lady? Um, they want those toys, they want to have a good time and that's what we're happy to be associated with. Miss Merriman was just telling me a few minutes ago that she gave you all the um, permission to play with children, interact with children, and we know that play is how they learn and how they grow and how they develop. Um, can you all think back just for one second, what was your favorite thing to play with when you were a child? Somebody tell me, what were your favorite things? Surely there was something. Mine was rainbow bright. Barbies, what else? Just tell me. Polly Pockets, oh, I love those. No guys, y'all didn't play? G.I. Joe? Digging holes in the garden, in the mud. But that's how we played. We played and we learned and we grow. Um, and that's you know so important in a child's life. There are so many different types of play. I'm sure you all have had child development classes and everything at this point. Um, but I wanted to talk about play in general, and then we're going to address a couple of areas of play. We're also going to be talking about diagnosis, education, preparation, and then support in highlighting three areas there in procedural, emotional, and family support. But let's first just talk about play. Play for normalization in the hospital experience. If you want to hit the next one. Um, I love this little poem by Anita Wadley because I think it really addresses what play is for children. So I'm just gonna read it really quick if you don't mind, unless anybody wants to volunteer to read it for us. I'm seeing like faces of like, oh my gosh, don't make me read anything out loud. Okay, so let's think about play just from the standpoint of normalization and learning and growing. So when I'm building in the block room, please don't say I'm just playing, for you see I'm learning as I play about balance. I may be an architect someday. When I'm getting all dressed up, setting the table, caring for the babies, don't get the idea that I'm just playing. I may be a mother or a father someday. When you see me up to my elbows in paint or standing at an easel or molding and shaping clay, please don't hear me, let me hear you say, he's just playing. For you see, I'm learning as I play. I might just be a teacher someday. When you see me engrossed in a puzzle, or some playing at my school, please don't feel the time is wasted in play. For you see, I'm learning as I play. I'm learning to solve problems and concentrate. I may be in business someday. When you see me cooking or tasting foods, please don't think that because I enjoy it, it's just play. I'm learning to follow directions and see the differences. I may be a cook someday. This is my favorite part for you all. When you see me learning to skip, hop, run, and move my body, please don't say I'm just playing. For you see, I'm learning as I play. I'm learning how my body works. I may be a doctor, a nurse, an athlete someday. When you ask me what I've done at school today and I say I just played, please don't misunderstand me. For you see, I'm learning as I play. I'm learning to enjoy and be successful in my work. I'm preparing for tomorrow. 
Today I'm a child and my work is play. How nice would it be if every day our job was play, right? And that's what I get to do every day, which is fun. So basically, when we think about that, um, play is always with a purpose. Um, every day whenever we come to the hospital, we think about the things that we're doing to interact with children. And in your jobs, I hope that as you are in your nursing positions and whenever you utilize play, that you can understand that it's also with a purpose. And there's so many things that we can do. So not only is it play with a purpose every single time, and we'll be talking about that throughout the presentation, but also it's basic mechanism for learning and refining cognitive skills. So we have children right now in the hospital. We have a child who is in our ICU unit and she's gonna be there for up to six weeks. Well, what do you think that means? She's out of school. She's not around her friends. There's no socialization opportunities. There's nothing for her to do really. Um, and it's a horrible thing for her, right? To be stuck in a room, but we know that if we play, that that will give her time to continue to sharpen her cognitive skills, also social skills and different things. Um, again, it promotes supportive therapeutic relationships. Um, play is a great motivation for movement therapy. I can't tell you how many times um, we get calls from nurses or um, physicians that will say, this child's had surgery, they won't stand up, they won't get out of bed. You offer the playroom, come on, let's go play trains down in the playroom. Wow, they hop right out of bed, you know, they're ready to go play. So again, it hits play with a purpose and things that we can do. Um, an energy release as well, and then also creates an environment for formal and informal assessment, which is something that we as child life specialists do every day, that you as nurses will be doing. If you can take time, and we're gonna go through some ways that you can do that. If you can take time, even three to five minutes, to play with a child or talk to an adolescent, learn what's important to them, it really creates an environment for you to assess them, their coping, their fears, their anxieties. So um, that's gonna be a, a really big thing moving forward. And then also it reduces frustration and anxiety. There are so many times, I wish I could just tell you um, that we've had kids, when I used to work in the cancer center and even at our St. Jude affiliate clinic, now you see this a lot. Um, they may have port placements and it may take them a few minutes before they really can calm down enough for us to be able to access their port or the nurses to. And it really um, gives them time to work out any kind of anxieties that they have um, if they can play for a few minutes prior to that. All right, so how this helps you. Again, just basic play. Sitting down with a child for a few minutes, finding out what they like, Ninja Turtles, Polly Pockets, whatever it may be, it builds rapport with the child. It out allows the child to feel a sense of control whenever they're going through that particular time. Whenever we're in the hospital, what are we, what are we, do what are we told? Lay down, hold still, don't move. I'm fixing to stick this IV in you, just hold real still. Oh, by the way, here's some oxygen on. Um, you can't get out of bed. We're told all these things, same thing with the child. Um, it allows them, the play does, to feel a sense of control. The child is able to make choices through the play. Um, it definitely provides an increased level of cooperation for you in the healthcare profession and also allows the child to experience a sense of normalcy within an unfamiliar environment. So um, I think those are all really key components whenever we think about just basic play. The next um, area is therapeutic play. And like I said, there are so many different areas of play we've talked about. Oh gosh, in child development, how many of you had a child development class yet? Anybody? Child development, human development? Okay, well that's coming. <laughs> so basically, um, you're gonna learn about associative play, parallel play, all these different things that give us clues to where a child is in a particular stage of development. But therapeutic play is really what we utilize in the healthcare environment and especially in a child life. Therapeutic play facilitates expression, coping, and mastery. It addresses a child's need to problem solve, resolve distress, and express feelings. And then I wanna kinda of give you an example and just kinda of stop there. Um, for example, therapeutic play may be, you may come in the playroom as a nurse and see me sitting down with a child and we're playing dolls with a dollhouse. 
and it's mom and dad and she's playing and telling me all about her family. So that becomes a therapeutic time for the child life specialist to be able to work with the patient because it may appear that we're just playing dolls, but you know what? She's telling me all about her family through her play. She's telling me what mom does. I had one child one time, she was taking, we were playing house, and she kept taking one of the little um, figures that she had called the dad and putting him underneath the porch. And I kept thinking, why is she going underneath the porch? So she just kept doing it. And you'll see here, the adult's role is the facilitator and reflector, not the leader. So I'm letting her have the choices and tell me about what she's doing. She was a long-term patient and I knew her family well and she just kept putting dad under the porch. And I said, why is dad going under the porch? And she said, don't tell mama. I thought, oh, love, what have we done? You know, and she, so mama sneaking out of the front door. She's, you know, looking for daddy. Daddy keeps going under the porch, under the porch. I said, Mama afraid she's going to find whenever she sees Daddy. And she said, that's where Daddy hides his beer. <laughs> so she's, you know, kids will tell you everything in their play, even when they're playing house. And so, you know, her mom, you know, it was like she was really, like, terrified. You know, her dad was hiding the beer underneath the porch. Turned out it was true. Um, so, um, but that's just one small example of therapeutic play. Um, it is child directive, and it's play in response to a child's own needs. So when we think about that, um, think through some of the things that you would be able to have in your daily interaction with children that would be therapeutic. And we're going to talk about, for example, medical play. That is an approach that we take in child life on a daily basis where children become familiar and have play medical equipment or real medical equipment that they're going to be able to tell us their fears, their anxieties. But many times, if they're not old enough, if they're a toddler, if they are, um, you know, even school age, they're going to be acting out through their play what they're really trying to communicate many times. And so therapeutic play is very vital um, in the child life profession, but also will be vital to you, I'm sure, as you get into your field of study as well. So basically how this helps you. Um, Therapeutic play really gives children increased coping skills. We're going to talk about medical play next, and you'll see, um, we're going to have some volunteers, I hope, but you will see that it increases coping from the standpoint that it gives the child an outlet of expression. We've just talked about that play is how they learn, how they grow, how they express themselves, but it's also going to then help them cope. We know whenever we're sitting here and we're I don't know, I'm mad at my husband, let's say. And I've kept that all inside. I've not shared that with my sister like I would normally do or anything like that. It's all inside. I need an outlet for that. A child's outlet many times is a play. Um, also, it's expression of emotions and then relaxation. Many times you'll see after a child has done medical play and say you have to go into another procedure. They've been very anxious about one procedure. We have time to play and really address their fears, their anxieties. Mm -hmm. The next procedure, you'll see that they're much more relaxed. They're comfortable in that environment. Medical play is just simply a type of therapeutic play in which children use medical themes and materials in their play. I've got some examples up here um, so you can see some of the things that we use on a daily basis. Um, first of all, let me introduce you all. This is Joe. I call him Joe. We name him something every day. Some people call him creepy. So, yeah, some people think he's a little creepy. But we have um, lots of different um, teaching dolls and different things that we use in child life. Um, many times children will not want to, we really encourage play not to be done on them because we want them to have an outlet to be able to pretend and play. And you wouldn't believe how many teenagers. I had a teenager up in our PICU the other day and she was um, a new diabetic. She was wanting to stick this doll until she couldn't stick it anymore. I mean, she did finger posts, insulin injections, everything. So it's not just the young kids who enjoy Joe here as well, but we have several other dolls like this. But um, not only do we have dolls that are teaching like this, and not that I'm wanting to like be gross, but Joe has all sorts of different overlays. And you all can see here, Joe has a pick line here. We're able to remove, depending on the case, whatever it may be for a particular child, different overlays where you can see how things work in the body and we can really explain to children. Oh yes, uh -huh, absolutely. Can you all see back there? So you can see how the pick line placement is and we can talk about not only what it looks like but also talk about 
where it goes inside our body and why. So we have ports, G-tubes, all sorts of different things um, that we can use to explain with children. So this is just one example of a tool that we would, might use during medical play. I wanna make sure I explain some of these before we just jump in. We also have things that aren't as big as Joe. <laughs> what do y'all think of him? Her, whoever she may be. These are blank cloth dolls and um, we have all sorts of different volunteers who make these. Some people think they look like voodoo dolls. <laughs> That's what you thought, isn't it? Yeah, they do. But it's so great because kids can take time to um, draw their own face on. And there again, that's a time of therapeutic play for us. You wouldn't believe how many times they'll put grimaces on their face. Or if they've had stitches in their head, they draw stitches on their doll. Um, I had a little girl the other day. Her port had been removed from here into the center of her chest. Um, she drew the port on the doll before we started doing medical play. So this is just a time for them again self-expression, um, but we'll use these as teaching dolls too many times and take this bedside. Then we have some that are a little bit cuter. I kind of like her myself um, to be able to explain things and stuffed animals. Brittany sees us all the time. We have wonderful people who donate stuffed animals and different things so um, kids can have those opportunities to play. So medical play, um, let me give you just a couple other examples. We have all sorts of little things like small little x-ray machines, so fun. Little MRI scanners. Kids, you know, are terrified to go into an MRI for all sorts of different reasons. The noise, going into the donut as we call it. So all sorts of different play equipment. We have the reel, the play. How many people like to play doctor when you're growing up? Doctor and nurse, that's why you're here today, right? Something happened that you wanted to be a nurse. So lots of play equipment and things as well that, um, that children can use to express during medical play. So. Therapeutic medical play gives children an opportunity to express feelings or concerns that they may have. Many times you'll hear children, um, and we're gonna get into some of the development later on, but you'll hear children say, it was my fault. Um, I've, that's a very popular thing. Um, magical thinking that children will have at certain developmental stages where they'll think that they got cancer and it's somehow their fault. Um, they'll think that they're gonna die from having an appendectomy. Um, we have teenagers all the time who are fearful of body mutilation. They're going to surgery and they're going to have their arm repaired, but somehow they're gonna cut off my leg. There's our fear things that basically we, can, we know about already just from development of children and adolescents. So not only do, um, does medical play give an opportunity for, to express feelings and concerns, but it also gives a time for them to become familiar with the medical equipment. One of the things that I always think is the most interesting is whenever you bring in um, to a young, like preschooler, toddler before surgery, um, you give them the mask before they go down to the OR, and it's amazing how, well, breathing treatments are the same way. You let them play with the mask for a few minutes, play with the doll, and then you know what? They're not fearful of that mask. They're able to put that on their face and not be scared. Um, but how many times do we fight with children? Respiratory therapists will call us and they'll say, you know, I can't get them to leave the mask on. Well, let's let them play with it for a few minutes. Let them become familiar with it. It's something that's scary to them and new, but by manipulating it through play, it becomes something that's not scary um, because they understand it. It increases their understanding. Um, they learn to practice coping techniques. Whenever we're playing in medical play, um, this is a time, again, if you remember, that it is not directed by an adult. It's a time for them to be able to play and express their fears and concerns. So basically, though, we lead them to some particular coping um, things. We're going to see in a few minutes um, whenever we, how we approach a child before a procedure is going to be very important, but we can talk about coping techniques. So during medical play, if we're sitting here and we're talking about a pick line placement, and let's say the child's not gonna be sedated. Let's say that it's an adolescent and they're gonna do it without sedation of any type. Um, we're gonna talk about what are some ways, you know, that we're gonna be able to cope through this. Do you wanna hold someone's hand? Are we gonna take deep breaths? Do we wanna listen to some music? Do we wanna listen to a podcast? Whatever it may be. Um, do you want your mom there? Do you not want your mom there? Would it be better for you to be alone? Um, so there's lots of things that during the play that we can talk about. 
Um, with children, young children, we talk about what toys do you want to play with? Oh, you're fixing to have a poke? Oh gosh, well then what do you want to do? What do you want to look at? You want to look at my Ninja Turtle spin light? So it's just different things that we can talk about to help them practice and learn coping techniques. Um, medical play also addresses times for us to reenact healthcare experiences. Again, I point to um, a lot of times our chronic kids who have port placements, um, for example. There are so many times that you'll have children just over and over and over um, stick a doll over and over. I want to access the port. I want to do the port. We call them buddies at the hospital. I want to stick my buddy. I want to stick my buddy. I have one little girl whenever I worked with her in South Carolina and literally every time she came to the hospital for her inpatient chemo, she stood at my door and waited for me. Most of the time I wasn't even there. I was working with another patient and she would want Mickey Mouse. That was her stuffed animal that we kept for her and the whole first hour that she was there all she did was pretend like that she was going to access Mickey's port and literally she would do it 20, 25 times just to be able to work through her fears and anxieties before they had to access her port. So it really gives them time to reenact their healthcare experiences. It's something as simple as going and having an x-ray or something more complex as long-term treatments. Um, it helps children develop a sense of mastery and it does again help them communicate their fears. So medical play and how it's going to help you, especially if you have the opportunity to work with a child life specialist, but I encourage you in whatever area that you end up, whether it's in pediatrics or if you're just working with children um, in the adult setting, that you're able to utilize time. It's really just a time to play but it really gives you so much valuable information. Um, so if you have this opportunity to work with a child life specialist, those are times that you can call us and we can help with those things. But of course it then helps with coping, compliance again, compliance of the child, and then also familiarization and clarification of misunderstandings. Again, you're going to surgery, we're gonna operate on your arm. They're not touching your leg. Um, your clarification misunderstandings would be we're going to the OR, you're going to have sleepy medicine, but it's a different sleep during the night. You're not going to wake up. So many kids are scared they're going to wake up during surgery. So it really gives time to clarify all those different things. Does that make sense? Yes? Okay. All right. Before we go any further, I need some volunteers. If you are going to be her nurse and you're going to go in and give her the opportunity for medical play, just a therapeutic approach. And let's just kind of set it up for you. Let's say that um, you're a new diabetic, you just were admitted to the hospital, and let's say that you're five years old, okay? You're five years old. So what are some things that you're gonna offer her in medical play? Well, um, with this doll, you could show her where her insulin shots might go, like on its stomach or mm -hmm. on its arm. What would you use that's over here that you might say, hmm, something that you might wanna see? Now granted, she's crying every time you walk in the room, okay? Oh. Every time. <laughs> Cry for us. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's more like, ah, ah. That's more like, right? Am I right, Brittany? Yes. <laughs> so you might walk in, so she's terrified of this right now. She's terrified of this. So what might you take her? I could take her, the little one, and let her Yes. And see if she wants to. And how would you do that? Yeah, we don't want her just to look at it. We want her to play with it, right? Come on, Sarah. Where wants you here? Put on yours. Okay, well, you can put these parts in your ears. Yes. And then you can listen to the doll's heart. Oh. And then once you've listened to the doll's heart, maybe I can listen to yours. Yeah, so, oh, I hear your heart beating. What's your name? Ashley, Susie. Hi, Susie. <laughs> so, is this going to hurt? Is this going to hurt Susie at all? Oh, you hear? Oh, you hear Susie coughing? You're playing, right? Yeah. So as she starts playing more, need to play more, but as she's playing more and getting some opportunities to understand what's going to happen, then you're going to be able to swoop in and you're going to be able to listen to her heart. Yeah. So I've listened to, you might want to listen into Susie's heart. May I hear Susie? And you're listening to Susie and now may I listen to you? Okay. And so it really gives them a way 
to be able to reenact those things and to express fears and anxieties. Does that help any? Yeah. yeah. A little bit? Okay, that's a very simple example. But same thing would be true if they were having insulin injections. Kids, you would not believe how many times this is the first thing they pick up every single time during play. And what do you think they start doing? Poking, 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 poking. But you know what they start poking? The eyes. <laughs> and we say, are we getting are we getting pokes in our eyes? No, we're not getting pokes in our eyes in the hospital. Yeah, you know, poke, 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 poke. Then they go to the ears. You know, younger kids will go to the ears. Again, they're, those are those fears and their misconceptions. They're thinking, this nurse is going to come in and stick that needle in my eye. You know, that's what they're thinking. But you know you're not going to do that. But through their play and if you give them the opportunity, if I were a nurse today, I would keep a couple of things in my pocket every day when I walked in. Something fun and a shot <laughs> and let them play because it's going to tell you the anxieties that they may have so um, does that help some okay you all get a stress ball so medical play again is just therapeutic play that's going to be able to address their coping and help us understand them more another thing that we do through play is diagnosis education um, there are so many different times that you'll have children who are coming in um, for cancer, sickle cell anemia, aplastic anemia, diabetes, asthma, all those different things. So as a child life specialist and something in your training that will be very beneficial to you as you're working with children is to know developmentally appropriate education regarding the diagnosis um, specific information, medical play related to that diagnosis, therapeutic play related to how the body functions with that new diagnosis, Diabetes is a perfect example, correct? You know, this is the foods that you're going to be able to eat. This is the insulin you're going to have to take. These are the blood sugars you're going to have to take. Helping them understand that, again, in developmental terms. Um, a big key thing in child life as well is school reentry. And that's going to be something that many of you will be faced with, um, whether it be you're working with an adult patient and their children are going to have to go back to school after their parent has had a diagnosis, or if the actual patient is going back to school after their diagnosis, it can be a very trying and difficult time for them. Um, of course, we've talked about the medical teaching dolls. And then another big component is also parent and sibling education. We're all about family-centered care, correct? Yes, you all have heard that over and over, correct? So when we're thinking about that, especially in child life and especially in pediatrics, you have to think about the parents they're the number one resource for you. Whoever that support person is, many times in today, we know that that may be an aunt, an uncle, a foster mother. Um, it may be somebody that's not even related to the family, um, but they are there and they're the support person. So you have to identify those people and also help them understand the, the teaching and the education that they're gonna need. Um, we're here to provide resources, address family issues, even hiding beer under the porch, and medical play um, to understand for siblings especially the different regimens that they're going to have to go through. Um, I know that not long ago there was um, a little, I go back to a diabetic again, and they had a four-year-old sibling and boy she was terrified because she thought that she was going to have to have the pokes and things at home. She didn't understand why her eight-year-old sister was having those. So. Um, you know, you have to really think about the other children involved in a particular situation. Again, it helps with coping, familiarization, compliance, and also it helps you just to become more involved with the care. Okay, so I think you all touched just a moment ago on this. Um, procedural preparation is the next thing under the basics of child life. Again, it's surrounded by play but it's play with a purpose. And our purpose here will be to prepare a patient before a procedure. And this is something I think that no matter if you work with child life or you don't, um, this is something that is so important for children and adolescents. Because do we as adults, like if we go into the doctor and they just whisk us off and they stick us in the MRI machine and we're freaking out and we're like, Hey, I was claustrophobic. Did anybody ask? <laughs> you know, so the same, three, the same thing is true with children and giving that time for them to be prepared is very important. So procedural preparation is the communication of accurate, developmentally appropriate information prior to a healthcare experience. 
Um, it includes the reason for the procedure, the anticipated sequence of events, and sensations that accompany the experience, and um, preparation materials, which we're going to talk about as well. As far so, as um, procedural preparation, is when children understand they gain a sense of control. Same thing for us. You receive increased cooperation from the child and the family. The child knows his or her role in the procedure, and the child knows what to expect. And then another key component of this is during procedural preparation, we're going to be allowing choices for the child, choices for the family, and that is when we're going to gain cooperation, which will be key to us in any procedure. We need the cooperation of the patient, right? And then the child will also feel more in control, and it um, will only be giving choices, though, when choices are truly an option. So, Brittany, are you going to be my child, or do you want to start the IV? <laughs> okay, so basically, whenever we're going to, and this is something that Ms. Merriman really asked me to address with you all. Whenever we're going to approach a child, Brittany, we're going to approach a child um, to start an IV. And again, we have to think about this in developmental terms. We're not going to approach a five-year-old the same we're going to approach a 10-year-old, correct? Yes, I'm seeing some heads. We're not going to talk to a 10-year-old the same way we're going to talk to a 16-year-old. So maybe we'll go through a couple of examples. But the first thing that we're going to do is let's go ahead and let's just establish your six-year-old. Okay, so Brittany's a six-year-old and she's going to have to have an IV start. And I'm going to approach her, but I'm not going to approach her like this and just all over. I'm going to approach her calmly, right? We want your procedure to go really well. So we're going to say, hey, Brittany, I brought some fun things for us to play with. Um, I know that you're going to have to have a poke today. And then you're going to get the response, I have to have a poke. <laughs> go ahead. Ah! Yeah, <laughs> I got to have a poke. And the parents are going to be like, oh, my gosh, are they going to tell Brittany, my little sweet Brittany, that they're going to poke her? beforehand and parents are going to get really anxious. We know that parental anxiety really increases anxiety in children, correct? Do you all know that? So it increases the anxiety in children. Let's even take a step further. I heard you all talking about pharmalo pharmacological um, pain reduction. So we can come in and we can do Imla cream or a Sonera patch prior to and the child's anxiety can go through the roof. Why are you putting this cream on me? Am I going to have to have a poke? So, as nurses, what do we say? Yes, you have to have a poke, or no, you don't have to have a poke? Yes, yes you're going to have to have a poke. Do we say, yes, we're going to give you a shot with a needle? No. What do we say? Yes, yes, you're going to have a poke. And the reason we're going to have to do that poke is because we want to give your body some medicine to help you feel better. Um, I'm putting this cream on you, or this patch, and it's going to numb your skin. As a six-year-old, do you think they're going to understand what numb means? No. It's going to help your skin fall asleep. So whenever you touch it, you won't feel the poke as much. So that's why I'm putting this here. But let's go on and let's play. I've brought you some other toys to play with. And then I'll be back a little bit later. Get their mind. Redirect them. So then we come back and it's, ah, i got to have a poke. <laughs> Literally. So we want to explain to them, though. Say, but Brittany, I'm here, though, to explain to you. I brought some of my fun play stuff. And so it's not going to be so scary. I want to show you what's going to happen. Do you want to play? Yes. Oh, of course she does. So then what we're going to do is many times, depending on your assessment, remember you've assessed the child because you've played with them at some point when you've met them, right? You've pulled out bubbles out of your pocket. You've um, talked to them about the things that they like to do. So you already know if they're anxious or they're not anxious, correct? Can mm -hmm. you pretty much tell? Oh, yeah. Yes, you can tell. Are they anxious or are they not anxious? Where are they at? So I'm going to know then that Brittany is pretty anxious, but I'm going to take it very slow with her. So I'm going to say, oh, Brittany, look what I've got. Do you know what this is? No. No? Look, it's kind of my blue noodle. It's kind of stretchy. Do you want to feel it? Oh, what's it feel like to you? I don't know. Yeah, I don't As know. As a six-year-old, I have no idea. You have no idea. <laughs> Neither do I, really. <laughs> but we're going to say, look, it's just a play. Do you see what she did, though? She took it and she felt it. Key component. We want them to feel already what it's going to be like. Manipulate what's going to be used on them. So look, Brittany, it's really just a tight rubber ring. Can I show you on Susie what they're going to do to you? Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> Susie, I'm going to take your arm, and all we're going to do is we're going to tie this tight rubber band around your arm. Now, again, we're going to talk about sensations, right? 
How's this going to feel whenever we tie it on there? Really tight. Really tight. That's a great word. It's really tight. It's going to squeeze your arm. Some people will say pinch and it freaks kids out. It's going to pinch your arm. Nobody wants to be pinched, <laughs> but that's how it feels, right? So like an older kid, like a 10 year old or something, you might be able to say, it's going to feel like a really tight squeeze. It might even pinch your skin a little bit. So you're going to say, hold on, Susie. It's going to be really, really tight squeeze. And it may pinch your arm if you're a 10 year old, <laughs> really tight. Okay. You feel that? How's that feel, Susie? Do you see how it's feeling on Susie? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, all I'm going to do next, Susie, is I'm going to feel your arm. Can you help me find Susie's vein? Can you feel there? Right there. Oh, right there? Oh, it's right there. So you know what we're going to do next? All we're going to do is look what I've got. I've got, ooh, it's kind of stinky. Do you want to smell? Smell, Brittany. Ooh, what do you think that smells like? Yucky. Again, we're talking about <laughs> sensations, right? We're talking sensations, what they're going to smell, what they're going to see. All this is, Brittany, is this is a little wet cloth and it's going to clean your skin, but it's going to feel cold and wet. Mm -hmm. Some kids, they don't want cold and wet on their arm. So let me show you, Susie. It's just going to be cold and wet. We're going to do it on your arm. D would you like to feel it? Does it feel cold and wet to you? Yes. Yeah, it's cold and wet. After we clean, though, you have to hold really still. Okay, so we're going to clean. Next, what I want to show you is all that it's going to be whenever you have your IV is what? What would we call Straw. this? Yes, perfect. You can tell she works at a children's <laughs> hospital. I'm so proud. Um, it's a little plastic straw. It's not the, you know, necessarily, and I don't usually take it into kids um, with the actual needle unless they're older, but I take it off and I say, look, this is the little plastic straw that's going to give your body a drink. Do you want to feel? Most of the time, children, whenever they have IV starts, they think the needle's still in their arm. <clears throat> Every, I mean, you would not believe how many times you walk in, even teenagers, oh, I don't have a needle in my arm? No, it's just this little plastic straw, and they'll feel it, and they'll be like, oh my gosh, you know. So this little plastic straw is going to give your body a drink. So now we want to talk about coping, right? We're time to the poke. We're time for it to happen. So what are we going to do, Susie, that's going to help you? What can we do, Susie? Do you want to hold Miss Brittany's hand while we do it? I don't know. What do you think? Yes? <laughs> I've got some really cool toys that we could look at. Would you like to look at one of my cool toys? Yes. yes. So there's, you're offering choices. But what we always say and what something very important for you always to say is tell them what choices they do not have. The only job that you have and the only job you're going to have, Brittany, is that you have to hold still. Mm -hmm. You can. Is it okay to scream? Yes. Is it okay to cry? Yes. It may give you all a headache, right? It's okay to scream, it's okay to cry, but you've got to hold still. So we're going to have the poke, and it's going to be just a one, two, three. Do you want to count or not count? Again, offering choices. Do you want to count or not count? I'll count. Okay. So on the count of three, you squeeze somebody's hand, you're looking at a toy. One, two, three. Owie's over. So again, we're just kind of going on through the process. And then what we're going to have is some sticky tape, if I can find the sticky tape. So basically, you see how we're kind of going through the different process. And then, do you want to tape it? I mean, we just go through the whole thing. So, sticky tape, do you want to feel? It's just, that's all that's going to be on your skin. Sticky tape. And then look, we've got a little pillow for you. We don't call it, you know, arm board. It's a little pillow. And we talk about how we're going to tape to the pillow. We walk through the whole sequence of events. And then we tell them at the end, how do you think Susie did? Good. Good. Why did Susie do good? Because she held still. Because Susie held still. Did Susie cry? No. <laughs> no, Susie. <laughs> yes, she did. Okay. <laughs> Susie cried. But either way, again, you're rehearsing through that. And I know because we work every day with nurses, I know that you all are so busy. That's why if you have child life, it is a great benefit because we can come in prior to and go through this process with the child. It will give you much better compliance when they know what to expect. And that's going to be key in your roles because what we know that you are pressured to get the IV started, get the meds going on to the next patient. Same thing, right? You're going to face those challenges. But this is true care from the standpoint of addressing their psychosocial and coping needs. And it's going to get you better compliance. So instead of them screaming and you wrapping them up in a sheet and 10 people holding them down on the third stick, Many, many times you're going to get greater cooperation and compliance from them from the beginning. Okay, so that's basically preparation, looking at, again, 
Many times, what does that look like? Just play, right? It's just play, but it's play with a purpose. Um, procedural support is the next thing. Again, something that's gonna look just like play. Um, procedural support is um, very important from the standpoint that many procedures are lengthy, anxiety provoking, and um, procedural support pro de pro provides distraction um, that can help a patient to focus their attention on something else. So um, I know we were talking about pharma pharmacological pain. Um, Non-pharmacological pain management includes sen sensory comfort position, holding pressure, motion, rocking, and then we're also going to talk about cognitive behavioral. Um, that's preparation, thought stopping, guided imagery, distraction, um, validation of the child during a procedure, and relaxation and deep breathing. Um, so the next slide we'll talk to you, and it says, this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Child life specialists are often directly involved in the utilization of non-pharmacological pain management techniques and coaching or supporting patients and families before and after distressing medical procedures. So that's something directly related to us. Um, I wanted to give you all some examples of positions of comfort. This is something, again, that will gain much better compliance out of your pediatric patients um, if you're able to utilize positions of comfort. Even today, I was working with a PICU nurse last week and I asked her, I said, would you like to utilize a position of comfort? And she didn't know what I was talking about. This is something that Child Life strongly advocates for because positions of comfort allow for good control for you um, during procedure while still allowing the child to receive comfort from their parent, okay? And I'm gonna give you some pictures and examples of this. Um, it helps the parent and child feel more at ease and in control. And then some positions, I mean, I don't know about you all, if I'm gonna be poked, I don't wanna be laying back and having people hold me down. I wanna be able to sit up, I wanna see what's going on. I wanna have the choice if I watch or I don't watch. And again, um, this positions of comfort will give us that. So let's go a little bit deeper into it. Um, some of the advantages are fewer healthcare members are needed, especially in pediatrics. I think the first thing that a lot of people think is, let's have five people come in to start this IV because we know, we know that this child is going to be a problem. Yes and no. There are going to be times that a position of comfort, no matter what preparation you've done, no matter what distraction we have, the child's still not going to comply and it's going to be too much for them. But there are so many times that children are able to do things if we give them a sense of control, just as what we would like. I'm reminded of a child I worked with in the pediatric ED a few weeks ago, and he had an abscess literally on like the inside of his leg, um, kind of really high up. It was in a vulnerable position for him. He was nine years old and the nurses had went in and they had basically held him down trying to clean the area um, around his leg. They called us because he literally was coming off the bed and at the point that we got involved, he was hiding underneath a chair in one of the um, pediatric emergency rooms. So we got called down and I had a chance to talk to him for a few minutes and of course he was terrified, who wouldn't be? But I got him to get up on the bed and we started playing and doing some different things. And then before long, after we had built a rapport, we were playing Legos for probably 20 minutes, we built a rapport and you know what? we started talking about the nurses are gonna have to clean your leg. So let's think about some ways that'll be helpful for you. And he decided to do a position of comfort. He wanted his mom to sit behind him and give him a bear hug so he could be stable, more stable for the nurses. And then at the same time, he decided that he wanted to look at something that would distract him. So he was in a position of comfort. He didn't feel like he had to be laid down. He chose not to be held down, said that he could hold still if given the, ch if given the chance, he would hold still. And everybody was in shock. They came in, they even sutured um, his leg after they um, had drained the abscess. And he sat there the whole time. Now he screamed and he cried, but he held still because he had the control and he was in a position and in a situation that he felt like he was in more control of. So it's a good example of this. So not only um, are the fewer healthcare team members needed, we were down to two nurses in the room instead of five after that. There was greater um, immobility of the child. There's close physical contact with the caregiver. The caregiver has an active role and can support the child in a positive way. The mom was telling him the whole time during that procedure, you're doing great. I was there telling him, oh, you're doing such a good job holding still. This is how much longer we've got. Keep holding still, you're doing great. 
and then of course it creates a sense of control for the child as well. Um, again, some highlights before we go into the examples. Children um, may still cry. Many times they will still cry. Um, but they tend to display less stress. And you will be able to tell the difference very quickly um, whenever you're working with the children. Um, a position of um, comfort can be initiated as soon as a child has um, received trunk control and head control. So around three to five months, which is great. Parents and caregivers um, should really never be asked to hold their child um, down in a vulnerable way. I have a dog and I can't even stand at the vet for them to say, you know, hold her while we do this injection. I'm like, take her away. I don't want to see it. So, you know, many times putting parents in a role where they're going to feel like that they're having to hold their child in a bad way is really something we shouldn't do. But giving them in a position of comfort to where they're comforting their child gives them a role. Um, also, um, parents and caregivers can lie next to a child on the bed. Um, which really works really well, which um, procedures that require um, the supine position. Um, Complement parents, again, family-centered care, we're including the parents in the procedure. And then positions can always be adapted to meet the needs for each procedure. So I've got some pictures and I'll show you all with um, the doll as well. Some different things that you all can do, and this is so practical, it's almost like, duh, why didn't we think about this? But it really, really helps. So where did Joe go? So for an IV blood draw, for example, many times the, I wish I could kind of, I'm going to have to sit. Is that okay? <laughs> so you may have your child sitting here, right? You're not making them lie down on the bed or anything. I'll do like this. You may not, you know, you're not making them lie down. You've given them the choice Would the parent like to hold them. So you may just have them sitting in the lap. And you know, you're going to still have access to their arms. A great one for toddlers that we use a lot is if they straddle their caregiver. Okay, so they're here. They're talking to mom. They're looking over here at whatever Miss Melanie has in child life. But you know what? Mom's got them right like this. So where's the arm that you need? Back here, right? Does that distract you? Is that any way, you know, you've got exactly what you need. They're looking here. So they're this way. Same thing can be true here. They can just simply be sitting front on instead of to the side. It's just simple things, but at the same time, it gives you, you're here then working and the child's here, but the parent has a way to control as well and to help you. So that's just something simple for like an IV draw, something like that. Um, this is one that I think is really underutilized and something that we're trying to work on is basically you see here in the picture how the child's leg, the parent's holding them. The child's leg's been over here. Mom still has a hold of the child. The child life specialist could be over here showing something, but really here's the leg, right? Here's where the injection is. That's all you really need access to. And the child's still in a comfortable position. Um, the next one, this is really not a good um, example, but again, sitting forward, parents can cross their legs. In the treatment room, again, these are all like small children, but again, we're not making them lay down. We've got access where we need. You know, the child is sitting here. I don't know if y'all seen a buzzy bee before. Y'all talked about buzzy bee yet at all? So it's like a cold vibration. That's something that's really beneficial. If some kids like it, some don't. The NG drop, medication. Oh my gosh, how many times do we struggle just to get the kids to just take their medicine, right? So this is a great one. The next one um, is really one of my favorites. Um, we use this down in the emergency department is a lot. Um, if a child has to be cast, laying back in a parent's lap. So, and a lot of times we will use like an iSpy book or book or something to where the child doesn't necessarily see what's going on. Okay, so basically how it helps you when a child has support during a procedure, they can hold still, they have more control. They're in a relaxed environment, and of course, they're remaining more calm. And then parents, again, feel like they're given a role that they, are, they can do during the process. All right, so <laughs> distraction during procedures. If we've got them in a position of comfort, a position that's not lying down, or a position that they're uncomfortable in, distraction and planned alternative focus can be very beneficial. Um, I wanted to just put a slide in here, some items useful for distraction. We won't go over this um, in detail, but you'll be able to see this. Um, 
Bubbles are so effective. I encourage you as nurses just to keep a bottle of bubbles in your pocket. Um, during respiratory treatments, it's amazing. Um, I work with a respiratory therapist down in our PZED quite a bit, and we'll walk in and a baby or a toddler will be just screaming and fighting the mask. You go in, you start blowing bubbles, and it's like they think you're a miracle worker or something. The parents are like, oh, you know, no, they're just distracted. They're focused on something else, very similar to what we would do. Um, using interve um, interventions effectively, we want to always give parents and patients clear instructions. We want to rationalize and describe techniques as being helpful or less threatening. Again, kind of going back to what you pointed out, Ms. Merriman, in the um, picture, we're going to put our hand here to help you remember to hold still. We're not going to hold you down. We're going to help you remember. Um, involving parents and including them in what's happening, the goal is always to decrease the anxiety of the parent as much as it is to decrease the anxiety of the child. The parent comes down, the child will come down with them. The parent goes up in anxiety, whoo, the child's gonna go with them. Um, I know that y'all are talking about these, but this is just additional pain management. I encourage you. Um, parents absolutely love whenever nurses pay attention to the pain that their children may be experiencing. So cold spray, sucrose water, sweeties, whatever you may call it, numbing agents such as Imla cream, Sonera patches, heat and cold. Um, Buzzy Bee is a prime example of that, vibration and cold, and then soothing items. I encourage always have pacifiers there whenever you're doing procedures on your babies, if they want to suck a pacifier. Um, items that are important to children, you know, they bring them to the hospital, their bear that they've had since they were age two or whatever it may be, having items with them. Um, but soothing items, especially um, pacifiers and things like that. We've been over play, diagnosis, education, procedural um, preparation, support. The only other basics of child life is um, emotional support that we really want to highlight and family support. Um, emotional support um, really gives time for patients to be able to discuss previous hospital experiences. We all have them. I talk to adults all the time, parents who will say, the reason I'm so upset for my child to have an IV is I had a horrible experience myself. It hurts. Or I remember as a child, I ran whenever I was going to, you know, I have a needle phobia. You hear adults say that. So in child life and as pediatric nurses and people working with children, we want to make sure that we're discussing those previous experiences, but we also want to avoid those experiences. If we can use a numbing agent, procedural preparation, distraction during a procedure and have a procedure go well for a patient and let's say it's just their immunizations you know you're working in a in a doctor's office and you're doing their immunizations think about how that can translate throughout the rest of their life if that's a positive experience and the emotional support that they'll gain from that um, it provides an appropriate outlet for a patient to discuss fears and concerns and opportunities for patients to discuss other factors that inhibit ideal coping. Um, uh, that's a big thing for teenagers a lot of times. Um, they, we provide a lot of just emotional support for them. The things that they're missing, their friends, the school, whatever it may be. So that's a key component in child life. Also family support. It's very important um, during hospitalization. Um, I, I was working with a mom. She has twins. One of the twins was in the hospital. Brand new twin was at home and she had a three-year-old at home. And the, what do you think she was feeling? She was the worst mom in the world, in her mind. But she wasn't. She was there taking care of her child. So family support is really a time, sorry, to be able to, um, to promote family play and interaction. And we do that a lot in child life. Um, increased family understanding, sibling coping and interaction, and allowing opportunities for family to discuss fears, um, concerns, and triumphs. Um, we have off chemo parties down in the St. Jude Affiliate Clinic. You know, that's a triumph. You've been through a two and a half year program um, and your child has just received their last chemo treatment and it's a no more chemo party. So it's a triumph. And those are things that we want to facilitate. So I want to let you all to look at this slide. I want you just to think for a second. In light of what we've talked about, in light of family support, emotional support, what do these things have in common? I want to hear from you all. Trait placement, new diagnosis, amputation, bowel resection with ostomy placement, anoxic brain injury. What do you all think those have in common? They all require medical care, yes. 
This is going to be something that they're not just going to go home from after they've had their tonsils out, right? Okay. The, um, the only other thing that I really wanted to address um, concerning child life was just death and bereavement. Um, as you're working with pediatric patients, it is a subject that none of us ever, ever, ever want to think about. Um, but it is something that is unfortunately um, a reality that we have children who pass and we have parents who in our ICU, that's one that always gets me, we'll have parents who pass in our ICU and children who are there that know that their family members are passing. So um, Child Life is there to provide developmentally appropriate education to family members, whether that be siblings, talking to children who are going to be passing due to their illness, um, we also provide opportunities for legacy building, memory making. Um, we're so excited at the hospital. We were just granted um, one of the seven Mattel play grants and um, that's giving us some new opportunities to purchase some legacy building um, stuff. So camcorders and iPads change the whole world, right? You can take pictures until you can't take them anymore. So making sure that we have those things throughout their treatment, legacy building, um, things for the families to go back. Um, also, we want to make sure that we're always thinking about siblings, the understanding of the patient's death through discussion, education, therapeutic activities. Also, many times child life will be there after following death. And we like to do as much legacy building prior to, but it's for keepsakes and memory items for the families. Um, we do hand molds, for example, um, locks of hair, hand prints. Um, I had a little girl who lost her dad in the adult ICU. Um, right before Christmas and that's what she wanted to do was hand prints that were side by side with her dad so she could have something and we framed that so there's just different things that we can do but how um, this really helps you um, parents appear to cope better when supported um, obviously there's lots of research that's been done on that and then also if parents and patients feel supported and um, are coping appropriately this makes um, the job of all of us a lot easier whenever they have a better understanding. So I did want to touch on that. Obviously communicating with children can present significant challenges. If we will flip to uh, terminology where we've got the first pictures. This is something I think that's interesting. Children a lot of times they don't get it. You know they think whenever we're talking about their red blood count they're thinking about Count Dracula or something else in their mind. They're not thinking about what we're saying. Same thing whenever we tell a tumor. This is my favorite. This really happened when I was at a cancer center. We said, ah, oh, the tumor's benign. <laughs> what do you mean benign? Every eight-year-old wants to be nine, right? You know, I mean, in their minds, they don't, they're not at a developmental area. The next one, for example, a CAT scan. We have to think about what children are thinking. Why would you scan a cat? They don't know what a CAT scan is. A stool sample, what's a stool in their mind? It's not what you're thinking. It's a stool sample. Why would they, you know, why would they want a stool? Um, so I think that, you know, as we're communicating with parents, they're going to know these things, but children aren't. How do you handle a situation when a parent disagrees with another parent about their child's care? Oh boy, that's always a fun one. Again, it's open, honest communication. This is what the physicians are recommending. This is what um, I understand that you all are disagreeing on the care or how we're doing a procedure. We need to find the middle ground and a lot of it, it just comes back to open and clear communication and trying to get everyone to reach a common ground. When talking to the parents about their fears of past medical experiences, would you want to do that away from the child or could they be in the room? What are your all's thoughts about that? What do you think about having conversations whenever children are in the room? That's why it's key for you to assess. Just as you're doing nursing assessments and everything else, assess them psychosocially. Understand their coping, understand the family's coping um, as to where you can really then address. Is this something that I should talk in front of the child about? Or do I need to say, mom and I are going to step out in the hall, we're going to go find you a toy. Uh, we've got a, a chronic patient that every time his family leaves the room, he thinks something is horribly wrong because they've left the room and they've came back with bad news multiple times. So I think again, it goes back to assessing their coping, how they're doing, and really looking at that on an individual basis. Um, what does dealing and helping families cope, how does dealing and helping families cope get easier? It seems like it would be easy to get attached to families and patients. It is. Um, is that a concern that you all have going into nursing period? 
you're going to see these patients, you're going to see those families, you're going to build relationships, and I think that comes back to our professional ethics, knowing our boundaries, making sure that we always, you know, yes, we're going to get attached to them, and yes, we're going to form relationships, but making sure that we're always keeping those professional boundaries is going to be key. Um, what's the most challenging aspect of being a child life specialist, and how can uh, we as nurses help you? The most challenging aspect is probably um, having the healthcare team look at the psychosocial needs of the children, and that's really how healthcare, other healthcare team members can help child life specialists because we want to make sure that we understand, oh my gosh, I see every day how busy and how demanding um, it is on you all and how demanding it is on the nursing team. We only want to be there to help and um, we want to alleviate some of those things for you and make it easier. So I think that that's probably the most challenging aspect is somehow being incorporated into everything so we can address the psychosocial needs of the child um, and the family and then hopefully gain better cooperation for you. Um, how do you go about telling a pediatric patient about death, especially if uh, the patient is dying from cancer? Honestly, um, on the slides that we had on communication, you all will see, um, depending on a child's age, they have different concepts of death. And I did not put that in there, but it's something if you're interested, I can definitely send you more information on. Um, some children, younger children, even below school age, they don't see death as permanent. So they may think that one, they've caused something for someone to die or themselves, or two, that death is not irreversible, that it can happen. They can, that so-and-so is, you know, grandma's died, but grandma will be back next week. So it's very challenging. We have to look at the child where they are developmentally and where we know cognitively that they understand death.